Welcome to South Florida Saltwater Fishing. I'm Heath, and it's time to get into the bite. Dolphin in the boat. Oh my God. Woo! Mutton snapper Let's right there, this. baby. Let's do this. 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 Alright folks, in this episode we're gonna give an overview of slow pitch jigging. We're gonna go over the gear, the jigs, the line, the leader, what you can catch doing slow jigging, and most importantly, the technique. We're gonna answer exactly how do you do slow pitch jigging. All this in what I call the ultimate beginner's guide to slow pitch jigging. Before we get into this though, if you wanna learn more about fishing, grow as an angler, or just see some great and exciting offshore fishing adventures, you can start by hitting the subscribe button. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell so that you won't miss a thing. All right, folks, so to start out with, we're going to go over a little bit of what slow pitch jigging is. Slow pitch jigging has its roots in Japan. It was invented coming up on about 10 years ago now, and the man who's given credit to being the forefather of it, his name is Nirohiro Seda. What slow pitch jigging was initially invented for was to entice fish in overfished waters to eat. Fish that were not interested in eating, fish that were overpressured, provides an easy target for them, enticing the impulse to feed from a fish that is at rest. So that being said, we can go and pretty much say that slow pitch jigging is jigging that is meant to simulate an injured bait fish that is trying to retreat from the seabed. So more than likely, whenever you are slow pitch jigging, you are bottom fishing. Now you can fish the whole water column slow jigging, it is possible there are techniques to get it done but more often than not like i said you're enticing a fish that is at rest to feed you're not going after fish that are actively hunting you're going after fish that are at rest and you are providing an easy target for them so when you're slow pitch jigging you're going to catch everything everything eats slow pitch jigs that's what makes it so addicting the unknown factor I mean, granted, you do go and you look for structure, you look for ledges over the reef, you look for deep wrecks, you look for deep ledges off the reef, or you can go out to mud flats, stuff like that. You're going to catch everything from small hand-sized mutton snappers and trigger fish up to fish like blackfin tuna and kingfish, bigger mutton snappers. When you go out deep, you can definitely get hooked into tilefish, black belly rose fish, and much more. Everything eats slow pitch jigs. I've even had it to where I've caught sharks that are well over a couple hundred pounds. The gear of slow pitch jigging is technologically advanced to be able to handle these hefty fish. And speaking of gear, that's what we're gonna get into right now to get this kicked off, is the gear. This is your typical slow pitch jigging rod setup. This is what I use when I go out. What this is, is this is an accurate Boss Fury 600N, 600 narrow. It is on a six foot six star rod, 78 inch rod. Now when you go over rods for slow pitch jigging, they are rated in what gram weight jig they can handle. This particular rod is made to handle jigs that are between 150 and 400 grams. These rods are super strong and very pliable and they're made to get this parabolic bend. What that bend does is it helps load your jig and whips it up, pitches it, and it lets the jig fall. This is very important when it comes to slow pitch jigging. You pitch the jig and it falls. That's what this gear is made to do. The jig is doing the work for you, along with the action of the rod. This rod is what's called spiral wrapped. What that means is my guides start out on top facing my reel and they turn counterclockwise to be on the bottom at the tip of the rod. You don't have to get spiral wrapped rods if you don't want to. I like it. It keeps my line from touching the rod ever, the blank of the rod. Back when slow jigging was first started, 
the gear was impossible to find, the jigs were very hard to find, everything was in Japanese. Nowadays, you have many manufacturers of it. My rod happens to be from the manufacturer Star Rod. It is the Plasma 2 series. You don't have to follow this. There's many manufacturers of rods and they're very budget friendly nowadays. Rods from companies like Goofish, rods from Tsunami, Gravitate, Temple Reef, and so many more that it's not even funny. I can't name them all. But it's up to you to take the dive and get yourself some gear. Now the next thing about this setup is the line. To do any type of jigging, you need braid. The line on my reel is 30 pound braid. Braid makes jigs react properly because of the non-give, non-stretch factor of it. If you don't have braid, you're not gonna be able to jig, plain and simple. So when it comes to your line, braid, there's a couple of different types of braid. There's J braid and then there's what's called PE braid, polyethylene. Now, don't let this confuse you. All braid is made with some amount of polyethylene. The difference is, is J braid happens to be thicker. Polyethylene with a higher polyethylene content is thinner. So let me explain the braid factor to you, which can be counterintuitive. The shallower you are, the heavier the line you can go. 30 pound braid, you don't want to go much heavier than that. The deeper you go, let's say you're going constantly out to 800 feet, you're going to want to downsize that to 15 to 10 pound braid. What this does is this prevents your line from telescoping out and forming a big belly as you're dropping out. Your line will cut more through the water. This is where that polyethylene braid comes in, that PE braid. It cuts through the water better. So if you're consistently going out deeper, you're going to want to consider finding it and putting that on your reel. You will get more line capacity to get you down deeper and like I said, it will cut through that current and that water and get you more of a straight up and down presentation, which is what you're looking for. So when it comes to leader, you can use monofilament or fluorocarbon. Personally, I like to use fluorocarbon. It gives a little bit more of a stealthy, natural appearance to your rig. The one thing you don't want to do is use a wire leader. Yes, I understand it's a calculated risk, but you do catch the toothy critters. They hit the jigs. These jigs have four hooks on them. Puts the brakes on them real good when they get stuck in the mouth and the gill underneath the pectorals, everywhere. The hooks go everywhere when you hook these fish. When it comes to leader length, you don't need a 50 foot shock cord. What I mean by shock cord is you can't hook your jig straight to your braid. You need a shock cord which absorbs the shock from when the fish strikes. That monofilament or that fluorocarbon is gonna stretch and help retract and pull those hooks and set them deep so that you can get set with that fish and start the fight and bring them to the boat without them getting off. My typical leader length is about 10 to 15 feet. It's not very long. And it is attached to my main line with a knot called an Alberto knot. And at the end of my leader, I have a single solid ring. Now you can choose to use a barrel swivel at the end of your leader it stops some of the spinning of a jig if you have a jig that spins a lot. All right, so now that we've gone over that line and that leader, what I wanna do is I wanna take you and I wanna show you how to tie your leader to your main line using the Alberto knot, how to do it properly, make sure that it's not gonna slip out. The great thing about the Alberto knot is it is a tiny streamlined knot that will slip through the guides of your slow pitch jigging rod that tend to be rather small and it's a tough knot. It's made to withstand the elements. The tighter your fish pulls against your leader, the tighter that knot becomes. Braid is like a Chinese finger trap. The tighter you pull against it, the tighter it's gonna get. And the Alberto knot is what's considered a knot that threads your two lines together. It's not tying two lines together like this. It's intertwining them. So we're gonna get into that rigging up right now. To do this properly, you're gonna need a couple of things. About 15 feet of 40 pound fluorocarbon. An 80 pound solid ring. A cutting tool. A sharp knife. And we'll need our main line, which is our 30 pound braid. 
The first thing we're going to do is you take your fluorocarbon leader and you make a loop and you pinch the end of it. Next thing you do is you take your main line of your braid and you pull it through that loop. And you get about six to eight inches of it. The next thing we're going to do is we have sent it from the front to the back of our loop. So we will stay, we will bring our braid around the front side and we're going to wrap it up over both lines, the tag and the main line of our leader. We're going to wrap it around there six to eight times. So this is what you have. You have your braid wrapped on here. So as you can see, we're threading the braid onto the fluorocarbon. Now we're going to wrap back down the other way, wrapping around and in between the wraps that we just made, going back towards our loop. You only have to wrap, you want to wrap about the same amount of times, keeping your wraps in between so it almost makes a cross hatch pattern. If you don't get it perfect, don't worry. Braid acts like a Chinese finger trap in this application. So, all right. Now, we are at this point. We have wrapped up and we have wrapped back. This is what we're looking at. So, you want to make one more time where you send your tag. You want it to come out the same side as you sent your line in. So we will go from the back through the front and then we're good. Now, we're simply going to pull down on our leader in both directions. And tighten it up and there is a streamlined finished Alberto knot. Trim up our tag end and then we will use our knife to trim up the tag end of the braid. Now the next step is to fasten our solid ring onto the end of our fluorocarbon. You find the end of your fluoro and you take it, you pass it through and I fasten this with a basic clinch knot. and grab onto the ring, pull that tight, now we'll trim off the tag, and there you have it. So this is all you have that is coming from your line. All right, so that was how you attach your leader to your main line using the Alberto knot. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go over how to assemble a jig. So typically when you buy a slow pitch jig from the store, all you get is the jig. You're gonna get something like this. You're gonna to have to buy hooks and split rings. And this is gonna be what your end product will end up looking like. So I'm gonna go over with you right now how to assemble this. In order to rig a slow pitch jig properly, you're gonna need a few things. You're gonna need your selected slow pitch jig. 
Two split rings. These are 100 pound class split rings. A pair of split ring pliers. Two sets of slow pitch hooks. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to put the split rings on our lure. The first thing we do is we take the split ring and we open one end of it with the split ring pliers. Now we are going to take it and we are going to fasten it onto the lure. Once you feel it bite onto your lure, you just sort of wind it on the same fashion as you would a keychain. Now we are going to install the other split ring on the other end of the lure. Alright, now we have split rings on both ends of the lure. Now we are going to fasten the hooks onto the split rings that we have attached to the lure. So it's the same process. You find the open end of the split ring, you pinch it open with your pliers, and you take the solid ring of the hook and you insert it. And then just like you're putting a key on a key ring, you spin the split ring around until it is completely fastened to the hook. Now that side is done, now we'll do the other side. Now your lure has hooks on both ends and you are ready to fasten it to our rock. Next step of the process is to take our lure that we have rigged up and we're going to use the top side split ring to hook to the solid ring of our leader. We find the open end of the split ring, pinch it open, take our solid ring, Your lure is fastened to your rig. Okay, and so that was how you assemble the jig. All right, now we're gonna get into jigs. So when it comes to jigs, the thing you wanna consider is the weight of the jig. Typically, you wanna keep your jig weight within a 50 foot variable of your depth. For example, if I'm fishing in 200 feet of water, I would say, hey, I want to use a 200 gram jig. However, I can go back into about 150 feet or I can head out to about 250 feet. So there are variables that help you decide what jig to use. The variables are depth, current, and wind. What is happening to your boat makes you decide what jig you're gonna use. So there's all sorts of jigs. They come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, weights, everything, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna simplify that process for you right now so that you don't go out and spend a small fortune trying to get into this. You can get right into it and know what the jig that you're using is gonna be for. So first, we're gonna talk about jigs like these. These are called long jigs or stick jigs. What it does is this is made for going out deeper in those high current situations. What happens is you drop out, You've got a lot of current, so you don't need a lot of flutter in this jig. It's gonna do it because of the current. The next type of jig is a jig like this, called a medium jig, also known as a stub jig. This is pretty much for everyday average condition. Whenever you're fishing, you've usually got some current, some wind, something like that going on. Stub jigs are what you typically start out with, unless you know you're in high current or no current situations. And the last type of jig you're gonna want to look at are jigs like these, flat backs, fat boys, basically made for no current situation. These jigs 
sometimes come with little pockets on the back of them made to catch the water. No current. Pitch it up and it's going to fall down and act erratic on its own without any current, without any wind, without the boat tugging against it. So again, the three types of jigs. The long jig, high current situations, deep water. The stub jig, the medium jig, everyday average conditions. The fat boy, the wide jigs, shallower water, less current. Great for over the reef's edge. So don't let all this confuse you. Jig selection is a science. The more you do it, the more you'll become in tune to what you are going to select. All right, so all of this is good fun and all, but we really haven't answered the main question that is on everyone's mind all the time. Exactly how do you do slow jig? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you out on a boat right now and I'm gonna give you some hands-on direction on exactly how to do slow pitch jig. Either way, I'm holding the jig. I don't have it underneath my arm like this, taking, loading the rod and releasing it. What I'm doing is I've got it down under here. That way, the jig is an extension of my arm. So when it comes to the technique of slow jigging, one thing to bear in mind is you don't want to reel on the fall. You want your line to pull the slack out. That is where the jig is fluttering. This is the pitch in the fall. If you're reeling up your slack, you're reeling on the downfall, you're not slow jigging. It, it's being ineffective. So you reel, load your rod, let it fall. Reel, load your rod, let it fall. Now you don't want to just do that. You can give it a double pump, triple pump, whatever you want. Double pump, single pump, triple pump. Or you can, you know, almost like your vertical jigging, which defeats the purpose. You want it to pitch and fall, but that's what you're into. You do that. You got to find what works for you, what the fish are biting, what they're hunting after. You got to add a little bit of flavor into it. It's not just pump once and pitch and fall. They're going to go after different things. You make it a little bit sporty, a little bit erratic, it increases your chance of getting a hookup. So if you're drifting away, you got to remember, pull your jig towards you and it'll drop straight down. Pull it towards you. Because we're looking for a vertical presentation. Okay, I'm pulling this way to get my jig reset for that vertical presentation. That's what I'm looking for. Pull it towards your boat and it'll drop down. Oh, and we got a hookup right there. Yes. That's how we do it. On the fall. You gotta watch out for that fall. That's where 75, 80, 85% of your hookups are gonna come. Again. Slow jigging is not a constant pulling back and winding down. You want to keep pressure on that fish. Keep that butt of that rod underneath your armpit. This is the switch up from under the forearm to under the armpit. And that's where the power comes in to reel him in. All right, and so that was some good old fashioned fun. That's the way you do it. You load that rod, and you let the jig fall. You never want to wind up on the fall. If you are, you're not letting the jig do its work. Most of the time, I would say at least 80% of the time, you're going to get hit on the fall. And then when you go to reload that rod, you're going to go, oh my God, I got a fish. And that's when the fun begins. All right. And so now that we've gone over all of this information overload, which can be a lot. I'm gonna take you back out on the boat. And I'm gonna show you what it's like to get into the hookup with a bunch of different fish, bunch of different times. You'll get to see the technique hands-on. We're gonna catch fish like kingfish. We're gonna catch blackfin tuna. We're gonna even catch two mutton snappers on one jig at one time. It's gonna be fun. We're gonna show you what it's like to get hooked up and bring in a massive shark. You're gonna catch everything with this and we're gonna get into that right now. Ground contact. Give it a couple of pulls. See if we can get in. Oh, and there we go. Oh, we got the hook up right 
Put his shoulders into it, take another dive. Here he comes. Right at a Let's see what we got. This is the part where patience plays a factor. He's doing some death spirals. We shall see what we got. And it looks like we got a black moon camera. A nice black one. I'm gonna have to gaff it. This is the power of slow digging right here. Oh boy, yeah, yeah. He's a nice, he's not, this is not a little football tuna. And there we go. Look at that black fin tuna right there. Slow pitch jigging is bottom fishing. You don't want to go too far up from the bottom unless you're in the mood for fishing that whole water column. Always try to go back down and check that ground, see what's down there. That's what slow jigging is, essentially, is you're trying to entice a fish at rest to eat. Never want to whine on the fall. That's when the jig's fluttering down and doing its thing. You want to wind and load your rod. Oh, and we just got hooked up right there. There we go. First fish. There it is. Gotta love it. Always. Always great when you get a hookup on that first drop. Means we're in a good spot and more than likely, you know, we can go back to it. Up, bunch of head shakes. This might be a false albacore, might be a little tuna. It's 
speculation is part of the game when you're fishing. Having a little bit of fun, doing some slow jigging. All right, he's starting to turn on his side, put his shoulders into it. We're getting closer. there again making the approach still about 30 40 feet away like I thought it looked like a shark like a big old shark Folks, that about does it for this episode. Hope you had fun, hope you enjoyed, and I hope you got a little bit of something out of the Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Slow Pitch Jigging. Till next time, South Florida saltwater fishing, going wherever the cool wind takes us.